I love how you've got the book up like this. It's sort of like, so you don't need the graphic on the side. It's just like, this is the graphic. Should I, I feel like, would it be- I don't have a hardcover. I've got the galley. I mean, yeah. What if I just did the whole interview like- (laughs) Just hold it up. I'm just like, you don't know it's me, maybe it's just- Well, I also spent 17 years at Condé Nast, so I try to match the book. So I was going through my closet going, what color to wear? So that like, you can't wear green. Green's gonna jump. Like, what am I- (laughs) You are three steps ahead of the game, Carol. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where my guest today is Mikhail Jolet, who is the uh, brilliant author and the brilliant memoir, Hollywood Park, which is a Book Reporter Bets on Selection. Over the holidays last Christmas, I stopped by the office one day and picked up this book because I knew I was going to be seeing him in January. And I always like to read in advance for an author. And I went home and read for two days straight because it was this powerful book that I just completely immersed myself in. And afterwards, I immediately wrote his um, editor and I said, this is a story of heartbreak and dysfunction, but so, so much love. The writing is solid and I was engaged from the first page. And I was rereading it for this interview and I had all those emotions again, which is really nice because sometimes on a reread, it's not the same kind of a thing. And I read a lot, but I realized in this book, I remembered specific passages. I remembered specific scenes, and that's a mark of a book that's really made an impact on me, and I've been so looking forward to sharing it. I got to meet Mikhail back in January at a media lunch, and then in Baltimore, where uh, he actually performed the book, performed the book along with music, and uh, to a group of booksellers, and it's an evening that we all still talk about, and it's one that I don't think we're going to forget soon. Um, Besides being an author, he's the creator and frontman of a band called the uh, Airborne Toxic Event. And we'll be talking about that too. So I so look forward to introducing to our readers today. Welcome, Mikhail. So nice to have you here. Thank you for having me, Carol. It's great to be here. That's really that's a really nice intro. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you wrote that book. You did write that book. <laughs> that's you. That's Are you excited? <laughs> Are you excited about the whole thing? Because you've had an amazing week already. No, I'm excited. I'm terrified. I'm stressed. I'm I'm proud. I'm I, you know, it, it sort of depends on on the minute. I, I'm trying to approach this moment in my life with a certain amount of just trying to be authentic to what the actual emotions are instead of trying to dress them up since that's sort of the point of where my book ends up anyway. Um, Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the truth is there's a big part of it that's got this like fear of um, what do they call it? Um, Fear of exposure, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. where you feel like you're standing at the middle of a 50 yard line at a football game naked. Yeah. And and that's, that's just, I wake up some mornings like, And then there's this feeling like, you know, uh, people are talking about you and they know too much and they know all your weak points and your vulnerabilities and it's awful and it's too much and you feel stressed out. And then sometimes, and then that kind of falls away. And sometimes I just am excited about all this stuff that's happening around the book because there's a lot happening. Um, A lot. I did not, you know, your first time author, all you want is for people to read your book. You just hope someone, I just remember finishing it and telling my wife, I just like hope someone reads this. I just hope anyone ever reads this. Um, so that's very exciting and then sometimes yeah there's just this quiet moments of just pride just I know I know how long of a journey this was and I try to remind myself of that as much as possible that like listen this is you know there's this I think there's this thinking in the modern world sometimes maybe it's always that where it's like a mythology that goes around authors or musicians or something uh, and if you can write something that's um, feels maybe special that that you know, that person is somehow special and it's not true. It just means that you went on a special journey mm-hmm. that for whatever reason, the hard work you put in or the confluence of ideas in your life uh, kind of brought you to this place where you were able to go on this epic, you know, quest to, I don't know, find a story, find a narration, find something that felt alive and really capture it. And I know how long it was and how difficult it was. <laughs> it was yeah. Really, yeah. Really very, very challenging. So uh, I try to remind myself of that. And then it kind of, then I feel a little less of this personal sort of sense of like, like you're walking on stilts, you know, and you just feel more like, yeah, I worked super hard at something. Um, so that's good. So let's start at the beginning, because I have to admit, I've had a con- fascination with cults, like through the years, and how yeah. people will get sucked into a cult and whatever. Yeah. So for the first seven years of your life, you're living in a commune that was a cult. So yeah. what were those early years like? Oh, um, well, we left when I was very young. So most of what I remember from the cult, um, it's, it's like I, I have these impressionistic memories from the cult. And a lot of my life was spent kind of growing up in the wreckage of the cult. You know, it was it was kind of like the, 
you know, I always understood it to be one thing. I was always told it was one thing. And then as, as time pr progressed, I kind of realized, you know, over time that it, it, it wasn't that at all that I'd been fed, you know, a number of lies and some of them were lies of omission and some of them were just lies. Um, and some of them, I think maybe my parents and others believed and some, you know, maybe there was, you know, um, other forces at work, I think mental illness maybe, or cult mentality, I'm not sure which, but, um, you know, it, uh, but the cult itself, um, you know, I, I'd always been told it was this great place that saved a lot of lives and it set out to change the world. Um, and it did. I think it saved some lives for sure. I think there's some addicts that will say I would have been dead. My dad used to say he, he was a heroin addict and got out of prison. He went to Synanon and, you know, that's where he got clean. And he always said he'd be dead without it. And then at some point it shifted and it became, you know, this once nonviolent sort of utopian vision of what this society was going to be became violent. It became paranoid. It became isolated. It became abusive. And this is what happens in cults, right? You know, and so, um, uh, it, and all of us, the children, we were just kind of treated as accessories to these decisions that our parents made to this political, social experiment that we didn't choose to be a part of. And then, you know, most sort of damagingly, the decision was that we wouldn't be raised by our parents, that the, the leader had decided this guy named Chuck Diedrich had decided that children didn't need parents at all. Uh, and so from six months on, uh, we were taken from our folks uh, and put into an orphanage. Um, uh, you know, I was 500 miles away at six months old from my mom and just, um, you know, raised by strangers, sort of handed off from person to person. And, you know, we lived like that for a very long time. So we didn't know what a mom was. We didn't know what a dad was. We didn't know what a family was. These things were foreign to us. We, we kind of had the words down. We knew what a, you know, like if you said the word dad, we're like, oh, that dude, because they'd come and visit. Mm -hmm. um, but the words didn't have any particular meaning. Um, and so when we eventually escaped because it turned violent, it, it was like I had to piece together what had happened because I, I was very young um, when it all happened. And you, in the beginning part of the book, you actually are writing in the voice and vantage point of a child. And I think that was so, um, it was so, it made the book so much stronger because you were actually seeing it not from an adult looking back, you're trying to see it through the child's eyes. Was that always a decision to do that? Or was that something that you changed along the way? No, that was a decision. So the book's written in the four sections. Each section has its own voice, has its own perspective, has its own sentence structure its own grammar its own vocabulary um and yeah i, I think I, i'd started the book a few different times and you know one of the voices was hi i'm a 40 year old author here are some things that happened to me which i think is sort of the typical memoir form it's almost uh, uh like a eulogy or something um and then there's sort of like autobiography which is like here are the dates and degrees of you know it's very dry um mm -hmm. and i thought you know that is sometimes uh, can tell its own lie because it doesn't capture the you know the character of the time. Also, you got to be like Secretary of State to write an autobiography, or else no one gives a shit. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then there's this idea of memoirs like emotional disaster porn. You mm -hmm. know, like this happened, then this happened, then they dragged me by my face into the room where I was beaten, and it was, it's just like, oh my god! And then, holy shit! And you just like turn the pages, looking at things. And um, my experience with it, um, when I tried to write it from different perspectives, I, 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 start, I did it once just from the perspective. I was like, I put yourself in your mind at you know, the day you left Synanon and just tell me what happened, what was in your imagination, what was in your sights and sounds, how did you feel, how were you responding? And then that, I think it was just, that was the voice that seemed the most alive to me. Mm -hmm. So I set out to write um, the book um, where the voice you know, is, is from the perspective of, precocious five-year-old, let's say, in conversation. Really, it's in conversation with a 40-year-old author trying to uh, make sense of this emotional world that he's going through, which is very confusing and filled with all kinds of deception and lies and violence and um, neglect and all these horrible things that he's trying to understand. Um, and he's confused by it. And you know, I think my book starts with some confusion, and that was on purpose, because mm -hmm. um, I was confused. And I wanted there to be this kind of disorientation. I'm, I think it isn't until like page 20 that you even know what's exactly happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that was on purpose. It's be, and it was, you know, and, it, and there's magical realism. I think at one point on page four, my mom turns into a bird and flies away. <laughs> um, all these little pieces, yeah. At one point I climb up a thousand feet into the tower of a stone castle. At one point I dig a thousand feet beneath Hollywood Park and find a 
my future self in a bright room. Like, it's like there's magical realism. There's tons of metaphor. And part of it's my argument with like the construction of reality um, in the mind. I think that's actually how we construct our identities, that these aren't sort of the tropes of fiction um, that have traditionally been left out of memoir because they're not fiction. I think these are actually, uh, you know, changing perspectives, metaphor, mm -hmm. um, the um, magical realism, uh, symbolism, that these these are the ways unreliable narrators we we unreliably narrate our own life these are actually the ways we construct our identity and mm -hmm. they are sort of the province of what it means to be a human trying to understand um themselves and so um i thought why can't my memoir have that so let's just put it all in there let's just try to make this and i think it's particularly true of children i think children live in this world that's you don't know what's real and what's not real i wasn't certain i couldn't fly when i was six i i kind of thought all right i'm not going to try it but maybe Maybe if I really flapped hard enough, I could make it happen. And so I thought, well, let's put that in the book because I think the imagination of children is vast. And I think the emotional world of children is extremely fertile um, and complex. Uh, and I think we forget that as adults because children don't have the language capacity and they don't have the, the sort of uh, perspective that adults have. But if you go into those emotional memories, if you go into the core, there's a lot going on. And so I thought, all right, let's just try to bring this world to life because it felt the most alive on the page and it felt the most true to the experience as it actually was in my mind going through these events. Yeah, and you actually see the child. You can see the child moving around. You can see the questioning. You actually, you're inside the kid's head very, very well of what was he thinking here? What's going on here? I'm not quite sure. Bonnie, who's Bonnie? What does she mean to me? Who's this other woman who comes? And you're having the questioning just the way the child's having the questioning and the reader is trying to put together what's going on as well. Because I think that the way you set up at the beginning, we're not really clear either about what's happening. Is this, what's he seeing, what's happening? And then all of a sudden it starts to go, whoa, 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 this is not a good safe situation. Right. It's not just in his imagination. Right. Yeah. And then there's this one point where you feel like uh, you learned you had a dad because you knew you were poor. You knew your mom was a single mom and you knew that like there were other people out there in the world. There are these men that were around, but to realize that this is my dad and this is what having a dad actually means was a really big moment. And you write that very clear, uh, clearly with a very, very vivid memory. Was that an easy recollection for you to come up with? Like, do you remember that moment or was yeah. it some playing around? <laughs> no, yeah, that one's, that one was really prevalent. I mean, sometimes you really have to dig and construct, um, reconstruct your memories through a series of different exercises, which, you know, um, I did a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, I did a whole thing to create sort of the world of the book before I even tried to tell the story that was in that world. But the but that one was easy. Like the first time, um, I mean, I remember seeing my dad in Sinanon. Like he would come see us on his motorcycle, and those were, it was always just this breathless moment. Uh, and then we escaped, and we lived on the run, and then we ended up in Oregon. And yeah, we had a mother who was a single mother, and we were. Um, I think if you're the sons, maybe the daughters too. I don't know what it's like to be a girl, but I'll just say for the boys, of a single mother, you know the world of women you know the world of, of women and, and I think, you know, it's not always different, but there's some ways that it is. And there's men are these faraway creatures. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's also part of it is it's this heartbreaking thing where you, you sort of sense your mother's longing for a partner. You know, there's kind of like this, you, you, even at a very young age, I knew that. I knew how much she sort of just wanted a man. And mm -hmm. I kind of knew I was going to become a man someday. But I didn't have any experience with them because our caretakers were all women in Sinanon, and then I had the single mother. And my brother and I, we were just trying to invent what a man was. And so we had this folklore about our dad that we would tell each other. And our dad was this like Steve McQueen meets, you know, Cool Hand Luke type dude. You know, it just all this crazy stuff that had happened, you know, before we were born. Where he was a professional criminal. He was involved in, you know, I don't know if you want to call it organized crime. He called it disorganized crime, but you know, it carried a sawed off shotgun and a trench coat for 10 years. He was in and out of prison. And, but he had all these great stories too. And it was like, you know, he, he escaped from a Mexican prison. That's a real story. He slid his bike once across the US Mexico border, uh, you know, uh, straight across at 60 miles an hour. It fell over and he just rode it like a scooter across. And it always created this image in our minds of this swashbuckler. Yeah. You know, like this pirate, like, ah. You know, one one foot in front of the law, you're not going to catch me. And there's always some moon-eyed woman in the, you know, just crying, just hoping he's going to come back. And I think some of that idea was reinforced by the fact that we knew our mom not only missed our father, but just missed having a, you know, a partner of some kind. And 
And so we, we, we created him in our heads, this mythology. And to us, that's what a man was. What's a man? Oh, that's this thing. And so we tried to act like that, I think, as a lot of boys do, um, and pretend we were that as well. So he showed up one day on my sixth birthday, where it said, and, and he just showed up. He was there that morning as a surprise. He was sitting on the edge of my bed, and here's this guy. We're these little do- toe-head Dutch kids, and he's got this big white boy fro and a mustache, and he's sitting there. He's like, hey, dude. And he, I was like, dad. <laughs> I hugged him, and my brother hugged him. And, and it was like walking down the street with all the other kids because a lot of the kids had single moms too. You know, we were just, it was, you know, it's a part of town between the graveyard and the insane asylum. It's not, it wasn't the glamorous part of town and <laughs> gravel driveways and dogs running through the streets. And, and, you know, a lot of the kids on the street, I think, uh, were like, oh God, a dad. Whoa, a dad's here. There's a dad. There's a dad. Oh God, there's a dad. There's a dad. Okay. You know, and they, they suddenly, these, these like shithead kids that were always trying to beat us up would be like, hello, hello, sir. You know, yeah. Yeah, so it was yeah. like having your own like genie, you know, it was like having your own God walking next to you. And that's just how big it felt. Um, so I remember that very, very clearly. You had that street cred that day. You were at street cred. Totally you had your cred. dad. Your, your dad was there. It was there. Only boys have a dad. He's here. He's still here. He's got cowboy boots. And I don't know. He's, he seems cool. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But you think he's going to stay? You think he's going to stick around? Stick around? I don't know. Are we going to, will, will he play baseball with us? Maybe he'll yeah. play baseball. And it's like, and, and when everybody's in the same situation, it's like you got some, you got a prize, you got a prize because your dad showed up. You were, you know, telling the prize thing. You know, you made me feel like you're watching the ponies with you when you were at Hollywood Park. You set that scene up, and it comes much later. Um, it was clearly such a special place for you. But that whole scene, when I would, was, was sitting there, I could picture the Cracker Jacks. I could picture every single thing that you were doing sitting up there in the stands. What was a day like there like? Like, because that was one of the things that really bonded the two of you together. God, it was fun. It was exciting. It was like, it felt a little like he was introducing us to his world. And again, it was this, here's where the men go. Oh, mm-hmm. they hang out at the racetrack. Okay, so moms sit around and play gin rummy with their friends and talk and drink tea and drink coffee. And that's what moms do. And dads, they go to racetracks. Okay. We're going to become one of these things. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> so there was a lot of like trying to, you know, learn all the terms. What's an exacta? What's a, you know, what's a pick six? You know, how do we box an exacta? What is it? What are we going to get in the third race? And then we'd always mimic, you know, our dad's little expressions. Like, you know, he's a false favorite, you know, or, you know, it doesn't make sense to, well, he's, favorites always lose. That's another big one for him. Or it doesn't make sense to, to go unless you can walk out owning the place. You always take these crazy bets where you just put all the money on one horse and one race. And you're like, Dad, what are you doing? He's like, got to own the place, or what's the point of us being here? So we'd say that. We'd always adopt that kind of – because we're – again, and the tragedy of this was, of course, we just were just inventing the men that we thought we were supposed to be. Mm-hmm. We were just – we, and we were faking it. We didn't know. We were, these, we were orphans. You know, we were, we, were, we were scared. We were lonely. And so here was this moment where we could just then pretend to be these, like, cool, tough guys hanging out at the track. And then also it's just fun. It's like impossible not to root for a horse race. I don't know if you've ever been to the track, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that last straightaway, you just go, go number four, number four. Ah, ah, and then you start screaming and everyone else is screaming and number four is charging hard and you might win 10 bucks. I don't know. And then, and then it's over and it's ex- super exciting. And then you try to get the next race. And so for us, it was, you know, it was this wonderful place where we felt, yeah. I don't know, like we could, we felt safe, I think, and we felt sort of heard because our dad was also just, just, despite being such a swashbuckler, just a wonderful, warm, affectionate guy. And and I think if you really were to probe the memories or probe the moment, it, that's actually probably the thing that we were responding to. Mm-hmm. Not so. I mean, I'm sure some of it was he could have been a really shitty dude, and we still would have worshipped him because I think that happens with boys and men. But for us, we felt very ignored when, when we were in Salem, Oregon, and so to be with our dad and with our mom Bonnie, like. Um, who was our stepmom, but we don't use the S word mm-hmm. in our family. Right, right, um, right. Is um, the, um, was we just felt heard and empathized with and cared for and, and something like that also kind of eventually penetrated my brain is that's also what it means to be a man. You yeah. Know, care for your kids. And cheer something on together. Like we're going to cheer on this horse. He's not going to be yeah. good, but that's okay. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. It's our horse. He's still our horse, whether he loses, turns around and goes the other way, he's our horse. Right, that's our guy. Yeah, guy. Do you still have a desire to play the ponies or did that go with the passing of your dad? Like, do you still have, I know Hollywood Park's not there anymore. Yeah. Which, 
Well, it's problematic because of what's been happening at Santa Anita, particularly in Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. And I have mixed feelings um, where I miss the racetrack because it's a place I like to go to remember my dad. And after he died, I would go a lot. Um, there's a story in the book of me taking my father's ashes, mm. illegally smuggling them into <laughs> Santa Anita and throwing them on the track, hoping I didn't go to jail because um, it felt like a way to honor him. Maybe it was kind of my private way of having a funeral, even though it was just the two of us. But if you went to jail, your dad's hand would have been on your shoulder going, good job, good job. Yeah, he'd have been like, <laughs> okay. You got it. You got it. You nailed it. That was really I mean, good. Actually, my dad would never would have wanted me to go to jail. He would have been like, run. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get busted. But like, um, but then I, I have mixed feelings because horse racing, I think, is something I'm, I, I didn't actually realize how many horses died. I mm. think this whole time until this whole thing happened. I, I just, and I'm someone who's been around racetracks my whole life. I, I didn't even, I just never knew. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't go these days uh, for that reason. Yeah, ethic um, reasons. I just yeah. in terms of like I don't want I don't want to be part of the death of some horse. Like and, and my father, as much as he loved horse racing, he also loved the animals, and I know he would have felt that way too. He would have been furious about what's happening in Santa Anita. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm 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 not too psyched on on that. And if they can figure out a way that they can run horse races without horses having to die, I'm going to be a lot a lot more in favor of it. Yeah, someday maybe then your son can go. You know, yeah. so we're gonna get her well, out. I have there. taken him. I have taken him. I you took have taken him on my first Father's Day after he was born. I took him to the track. Oh. And I have these pictures of him as a little baby, and the horses are running. My wife and I are there, and we're holding him up, and there's the horses are in the background, and he's in the foreground, this little bald little baby, like, yeah. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, I, just, I wanted it for posterity. I was like, okay. It's exactly. It's a good memory. It's a good memory. You know, back in the early days when you were in school. It, it really wasn't something you excelled at. Like you went to school sometimes, didn't even go like all the time. Yeah. Was there a time where you just sat there and said, um, and I know we're going to get into later on, you know, when you went to college, was there a time when you, were you just clocking the days when you were going to school? Was there anything that you particularly enjoyed when you were there? Did you like reading? I like to read. I just didn't do it for school. I was really mm -hmm. into like Jack London and these nature books by Calgard and people like um, Road Dahl, obviously, um, like every other kid. I, I loved James and the Giant Peach. The idea of escape was always really big for me. So mm -hmm. to escape in a giant peach, great. Um, so, but it was always a private thing. It wasn't something I did for school. Um, and I knew, I kind of knew I was good at school um, from day one. I, I, you know, I always sort of was aware of like the whole thing where I was supposed to skip a couple grades very early on so maybe it gave me a cockiness I was just thought like eh. and so but I got terrible grades I didn't you know I didn't study it didn't cross my mind to study it and I probably some of it was just I was dealing with so much at home mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I had to do five hours of chores a day by the time I was eight um, and sometimes I think about that as abuse a uh, mm -hmm. type of abuse and maybe not in the way that it was that maybe maybe it's more that we weren't really thought about um, but then other times I think, well, you know, doing chores taught me a lot about hard work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe taught me too much because I have a part of myself that's just like an absolute, you know, bully. And I think a lot of people who end up as artists or writers, academics, there's a part of yourself that's like, we're not even going to check if we're tired. We're not even going to check if we're happy. We're going to do the thesis. We're going to mm -hmm. do the book. We're going to write the article. We're not going to check in. And, mm -hmm. and there's that part of us that's just so driven by outcomes. Uh, which maybe isn't totally healthy and you have to learn as you get older to balance if you want to have some sanity so you can be someone other people can be around. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, at the time, I, I think I didn't know that. I just, we just, I just did chores and did chores and did chores and did chores and did chores. And at the same time, though, you were also, you were drinking at 11. You were like, because you'd had no boundaries. There were no boundaries about what was going on. Did you think that there was something wrong with, oh, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna have a beer, or I'm gonna go do this, that, the other thing. Did you think it was wrong, or did you think that was just yeah. the office? That's what was great about it, <laughs> is wrong. That was the whole point, you're trying to get away with it. It was like, fuck these adults, and fuck this world, and I'm, yeah, of course I'm gonna go drink. What else you got? Yeah. You got pills? You took one. What happens if you take five? Let's take five, okay, fuck these people. I mean, that was the attitude. We were just angry. By that yeah. age, I was angry, I was furious. And right. my brother was too, and we were just, crazy we were just running through the night man we had this group of little skate punk kids that we ran with and you know we did stupid stuff like wrote graffiti on walls and egg buses and we'd sneak out at night we always went to my friend's house and we'd go and spend the night and you know it was all these kids that would like because his he, we'd have like the one lenient parent that never was really like we'd get high with his mom stuff like that and so like 
we'd sneak out and then we'd go, you know, destroy the neighborhood. That was the, that was the activity. And like, why did we want to destroy the neighborhood? Right. We, we, we threw, um, like bricks through windows. Um, we, we pushed over motorcycles. I don't know. We, we destroyed lawns. We tipped over garbage cans, just like basic little shithead things. And I, I mean, at the time, I think we just thought it was fun and there would be a moment of like adrenaline. So it was part of it was just the adrenaline high of like, here comes the crash and like, ah, dog starts barking, lights go on. You hear someone like, whoop, 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 you know, and then you, you start running through the streets like, let's go, come on. And that was part of it. Trying mm -hmm. to get away with it. Maybe you hear a, a siren sometimes and it was like, yeah. Um, but then I guess if you probe it a little bit, the question is, why were we angry? And I think we were just angry because nobody had listened to us. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any outlets and nobody cared. And um, by the time uh, we went to live with my dad and my mom, Bonnie, we were already just so mad because we'd spent so many years feeling kind of ignored. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was fun to feel bad. That was part of it, 100%. Mm -hmm. And your mom was emotionally demanding. Like she wanted you to be with her. She didn't want you to be with your dad. So it's like you were the parent in a lot of ways. Was it hard reliving these moments or because there's, yeah. Hard. Yeah, that was hard. There were certain things that were, you know, hard to write about and certain things that were easy to write about, particularly the college chapter, you know, mm -hmm. was probably the hardest chapter to write for me. There's a long 10,000 word chapter right in the center of the book. Actually, maybe it's in the final third of the book, I guess it's it kicks off the fourth section of the book. And, and um, I mean, it's the first introduction of the final voice. Um, and I think I even start the whole thing with this one super ornate sentence. Cause I'm really just trying to make the point. I think maybe I overcompensated. I don't know, but you know, it's all about the, the marriage of verdant green, like an aquarelle is the marriage of the verdant greens. And I don't even remember, you know what I'm like, I'm going to misquote it, but. Um, that when you misquote your own book, right? No, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, really it's, by memory. it's a long book. I don't remember. It's a know, long book. It's a long book. I, I can't, I'll, I won't jump in either. The know? point is that each section had its own voice. It has its mm -hmm. own perspective and it has its own grammar, vocabulary, sex structure. So that last one, I really was like, okay. In some ways it was like, hey, I get to, now I can stretch my wings a little because it's really hard to write, you know, in, you have to do a lot of exercises to write in a voice. And so mm -hmm. much of this was written in a different voice. And so now it's like, I get to be my adult writer voice. Okay, cool. We can have subordinate clauses. We can use an Oxford comma. You know, we can do M dashes. We can do all kinds of fancy stuff uh, with paragraphs. So, you know, whereas before it's all very declarative and it's very much almost sort of like you're seeing the reality of a child just kind of unfolding in front of you and him trying to make sense of it. So that section about my mom and college and coming to terms with what sort of she was, what she had been, how I actually felt about it, the moment um, in the facility, and I don't want to give too much away mm -hmm. where it's sort of revealed to me, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard. It was a hard moment in my life. It was hard at the time. You know, I was suicidal for a while, and it's the only time in my life I've ever really been suicidal, and I was very depressed, and, and for some reason, those things were hard to write about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, learning, as I did, the things I learned from my psych classes about what Synanon was and about maybe who I was as a result of it, that stuff was actually terrifying for me to write. And I, I, have a, I have an expression on my wall, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in that section, there's a lot of tension because uh, I felt very tense about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember finishing it and I wasn't even sure if it was good. I was just scared the whole time I was writing it. Uh, and then I gave it to my wife and she was like, babe, I couldn't put it down. It was like the most, the, the writing. So, and then I, I think I sat it for a couple of months. And when I came back and I read it, I was like, oh, I see. There's the tension's what drives you forward. Mm -hmm. It was hard to write. Mm -hmm. um, some things I think are harder to admit than others. Some things are harder to deal with. It's not that hard emotionally as an adult to write about the tragedies that befell you as a child uh, because you're just so obviously innocent. You know, mm -hmm. you know uh, I think some of the things as you get older, particularly as they start to affect your adult relationships, you know, when you start to realize maybe you're a little broken too, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you didn't escape unscathed like you thought you did. Those were hard things. And that was really, it became kind of a call to arms then to sort of finish that loop. The whole ending of the book is me trying to finish the loop that I opened at the start, which is, I think a lot of memoirs, um, that I even ones I love kind of end where mine ended at section three, which is mm -hmm. I got, I got a scholarship to Stanford. I got out. Okay. That is exactly. literally the ending of two of my favorite memoirs. Um, and 
and you know it's sort of like this sense like okay he beat the demons he beat the odds a traumatic childhood has been survived and i think by opening the thread and the start of the final section and this was something that i was pushed to do a lot by my agent um susan Gollum, who's also like an incredible editor in her own right just a genius human being she she was like i really need to know this struggle i really mm-hmm. need to do more about this this story I want to know who that kid became and I want to know how you dealt with it because that's actually, and I think there was something kind of modern about that. Like in the modern world, we understand ourselves to not necessarily have survived our traumas. We have right. to deal with them. We have to go to therapy. We have to talk about them. We have a language around schizophrenia, alcoholism, mental illness, depression. We know these things in the modern world. So if I'm going to write a modern memoir, that's really trying to be rigorous in the sense of the literary sort of tropes that I deal with at the start of the book, then I sort of owed the reader at the end of the book, okay, so who are you now? And how'd you become that? And what actually happened? And that was hard. Cause then I had to write about therapy and I had to write about depression and I had to write about mental illness and I had to write about addiction with an adult eye. Mm-hmm. Revisiting that was, man, I had to really put a lens on myself in ways that were not always comfortable and, you know, not always um, easy. And I, and I like where they end up, mm-hmm. you know, I'm happy and proud of where the story, the, the story ended and, you know, where my life is at this point for sure. But at that point I was very uncomfortable with it and it was difficult. Yeah. And if, at one point you plan to stop the book there, you plan to stop the book as I got into Stanford, this is what happened. And your dad was proud of you. And he cried when you got in, you know, all these moments and it could have ended there. Yeah. Very, very much. And I went to class and I did this and I did that, but it's sort of when you went to class, you were with other people who had very different backgrounds. And I think that that's where you start to see my life was not like that. Their mom's dropping them off at college and making their bed for them. And they're, you know, calling <laughs> home and, you know, yeah. who are these people? and What are well, you doing? You know? It was racial too. You know, I went to all black schools. I just, LA Unified was, there weren't that many white kids. I went to Orville Wright Junior High School and Westchester High School. And if you look at my high school yearbook, I'm the only white face on the whole page there's all these students with one white face and sometimes i would show my college yearbook or my high school yearbook to people and they go oh, wow your high school was diverse and i'd be like no it wasn't it was black <laughs> i was a diverse i was a diverse person yeah. Yeah. Um, but like it but it was great too because it was sort of like getting a window into another culture i was sort of felt like i was on the track team and you know these these really upright you know, parents of my peers would come and they would just pray for the team and they would want me to come to church and they'd bring food. And I just felt kind of like part of this society of people who were, it's a good school. Westchester High is a good school. Um, And it had a sense of, I don't want to say it was like an HBCU because that's overstating things, but there was this sense of like black pride, black pride and struggle. And to witness it as a kid whose dad was in prison, as a person raised in foods by, with food stamps and poverty with a single mother, uh, I think that story was less rare than it would have been in a white school. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I wanted the same thing my peers wanted. You know, the, the AP students in my class, they wanted out. Mm-hmm. They wanted to get up. They wanted to work their way out. And so I was proud to be part of this, proud to be learning about how do you survive as this kid from this other place in a hostile world? Because that's a lot of what, you know, the kind of culture of the school was trying to teach the the, the students, particularly the high achieving students. So then I get to Stanford. And it's like so white. <laughs> I, just, I had never seen so many white people. I was like, there's tall ones and short ones and fat ones and skinny ones and stylish ones and white people who thought they were cool, which was not something I'd ever experienced. You, know, <laughs> cool. you couldn't be cool and white. It was like an oxymoron. And so suddenly it was, it was like weird because I remember it was the height of the PC thing too. So there was like, there was all the different lunches, you know, there was the, there was the uh, Black Student Union lunch and the Mecha lunch and the Asian Pacific Islander lunch and the Native American lunch. And then there was lunch. <laughs> You're like, wait a second. And I went to lunch. They might as well call it white lunch. And I just went to white lunch. And I remember sitting across from these people who went to like Exeter right. and Andover. And right. they're sitting there with their game hats and their little flannel shirts. And I'm like, what the fuck do I have in common with this person? at all other than we both have white skin i guess and you know we, we our moms make tuna fish sandwich with actually my mom never made tuna i, I made tuna fish sandwich <laughs> with mayonnaise and mustard and nothing else i don't i i literally don't know what do you, you talk about the gap i don't know what people talk about what shared you know identity we had so it was disorienting it was weird and and what i kind of learned over time was the the 
the thing I was sort of failing at was I didn't understand the language of money. And there was just a lot of money. And, and, and money, not like big money. There's big money too, but there was just a lot of upper middle class kids. Mm -hmm. what we call upper middle class kids that went to like good schools in upper middle class neighborhoods. And I didn't understand, I didn't even understand that. I didn't even understand how that world worked. So I learned to kind of create a mask of this person. I would leave out huge events in my life. And I think all of us do this to some extent, right? We create masks and we present a version of ourselves to the world. Uh, Cause I got sick of, if I ever brought up, you know, I don't know, Synanon or, prison or addiction or AA or any of the things that kind of define my, my childhood. Like people would just look at me like I was this wild dog up a leash. Yeah. I was this circus freak. And I got, I got sick of it. I got sick of being defined by my parents' decisions. And I, and you know, I didn't, I wanted out. The whole point was I wanted out. The whole point was I didn't want anyone's pity and I didn't want anyone's scorn. And I just, I just wanted to try and go be one of those people in the world that could do cool things. You know, that was the reason to go off to a fancy school. Um, so I created this facade and this mask and it was sort of like the child that I was invented the man that I became in order to deal with the trauma that he had. I had to invent this person and this person was very, you know, confident and sunny and, you know, really interested in school and politics and doing the right thing and very straight edge, you know. Um, and uh, I kind of stuck with that person for a long time. And, and, and something about writing the book was a sort of unmasking. It was sort of like, okay, we're going we're gonna to tear down this facade and we're going to try and talk about the person who created the facade. Uh, and I think that's probably the heart of why it's, it's actually so scary for me mm -hmm. is um, the part of that's, that, that fears people seeing, I don't know, how broken you were, mm -hmm. how lost you were, mm -hmm. how just actually hard things were in so many different points in your life. Um, that's reason I invented that other person. Well, you know, there was an article in the Times um, at the beginning of the pandemic. There were kids that went to school. I can't remember which college it was. And on the campus, everybody was equal. They went to class. They went to lunch. They went out drinking. They did everything. And then the pandemic happened. And one girl went home. She was very wealthy. She went to her home in Maine, like her family's vacation home. Yeah. The other girl went to Florida and helped her family run the food truck in Miami to make sure they still have food on the table. And the other kid yeah. was trying to get home to Russia because yeah. she was, so everybody had been here and then everybody went these different places. And for you going home, like on spring break or Christmas break or something like that, you went to a very different world than these other kids were going home to. It was, you had to see the dysfunction again. You had to see, you know, no, like what was going on. I don't know about college, if that was true. I think okay. like college, cause I was living in Oregon or sorry, I was living in Los Angeles. I'd already left Oregon and I was living with, you know my dad and bonnie and in, in la and they were good parents i mean they're, they're really sort of the bad home part of it you know was probably over by the time i was 11 you know and and at that point i was just trying to figure it out you know mm -hmm. started off being rebellious and then actually i think having been in this really stable home environment is part of what helped me thrive and become a good student and an athlete and all the things that i did in high school to try to get out so i i, I wouldn't say that um i think i mean obviously lots of people do have that happen. That wasn't really the nature of my experience in college. I actually, I actually really missed them a lot because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, I, I went and saw them a lot um, because uh, they were just, they, they accepted me. They loved me. They liked me. They were good. They were good parents. It was a good home. Um, they were excited for you. They were excited they were so for you. Excited. You were so excited. Friends. So just bursting with pride for their son. And, you know, and I, I, I'd made it to, you know, this this sort of new plateau for the family i was sort of like the the astronaut you know going off into space to do this this new thing that nobody had really done before so they were extremely excited and also just they were fun to be around you know my mom bonnie and and my dad are just funny people and they 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 kind of wanted us to be funny we always they just they had a lot of personality and a lot of jokes and the whole family on that side bonnie's family you know they're all jewish and I was sort of like raised partially as this little goy kid in this big Jewish family and everyone's <laughs> just talking and arguing and making jokes and eating and you're always together and you're going places and you're always the loudest table. And it was, it was great. It was great. And it's the college boy home from Stanford. Here he is. He's home. He's home. But there you also- Our boy chick, he's here. He's, he's, here. he's, he's come home. I'm cavelling. The homish book is here. Okay. And we should feed him. We should feed him. He we has not had enough him. food. We had not enough food. Always a Chinese, though. Always Chinese. That's, that's, <laughs> it's Christmas Day. It was always Chinese in Chinese. movies, right? <laughs> that's right. 
because we don't know what's in it. We don't know about the Hazar Shemot. We, we don't know. We do, it happens back there. So we're just going to eat whatever they put in front of us. I'm sure it's fine. It's all good. It's all good. But it also in college, you started unpacking the real you, the, pe- the real you, not the person that was performing and all that. And the one that kept, you know, the kid who kept the plates in the air the whole time, which was like really kind of exhausting. So you did a lot of therapy. I like love the line. I think you said you went like for five years, twice a week or something like that. It was, but to come out on the other side of that, I think is the reason you can write the book that you did because you can at least accept that's the way those things were. That was yeah, I then. think that's right. I think the big insight of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy in the modern world is reflection creates externalization. And once you can externalize things, you can look at them. You can't really look at something that's right here. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's how we experience our emotional worlds and a lot of our identities and choices are sort of like stuff is right here. And so you talk about it, you talk about it, you talk about it, and you're like, oh, that's what that is. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. And then you can start to go, all right, well, I'm going to shift some of my decision making and then eventually you know you can decide a little bit more um you get to know yourself a little bit better and a lot of it was getting to know myself and getting to understand these different events getting to sort of unpack them with some perspective and go like oh yeah that was probably not good that i spent the whole first part of my life in an orphanage maybe Mm -hmm. we should talk about that (laughs) <laughs> let's discuss what the ramification of that might be you know what, what, yeah. what really happened there no affection or whatever right. um, you know it that it having a mother with mental illness you know struggling with crippling depression and elements of i think you know cluster b issues like that was that that has a very predictable set of effects on a, a child growing up mm-hmm. around addiction has a very specific effect and then of course being an orphan has its own stuff and so some of it was learning who I was, some of it was sort of learning the universe of things around and then starting to just kind of accept these things, be okay with them. That And through that kind of uninvent, the larger than life guy that didn't, wasn't really real, um, that I invented to try and deal with it. Yeah, because then you have to realize, well, life is kind of normal too. It's not all up here. It's not all down here. It's somewhere in the middle. But you weren't growing up alone. You had a brother who you were close to. You actually were really close to. And you both he went on some different paths, some not healthy, whatever. Has he read the book? Has yeah. he? What does he think? God, he was the person I was most nervous about reading the book because mm-hmm. I, I, I spent, um, start to finish three years writing the book, um, just this massive Microsoft Word document. <laughs> uh, and I probably, I overwrote too. I wrote probably 500,000 words total yeah. and I edited, 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 edited. And, and um, he, um, uh, I, he didn't know how much I was writing about his life, about the personal details of his struggle with addiction and some of the stuff with his son. And so I, I'm really nervous about him reading the book because uh, it's like he has your, your sibling has your number. Your mm-hmm. sibling is the one that can really call bullshit. They can be like, all right, because um, they were there. And he read it in two days and then he, and he called me. He said, all right, why don't you come over? We'll talk about it. So I went over to his house and we sat there and he said, you know, I'm not going to lie. Some of this was hard to read. You know, mm-hmm. um, but I wouldn't change a word. He's like, you nailed uh-huh. it. He was like, I'm, I'm. He's like, it's all true. I mean, I don't always look good, but you don't always look good either. And, and you, and you told the story. You know, we, my, bro- and he, he said what he said was, it, maybe it'll help people, which I thought was really generous of him. He was just very generous, very warm, very big-hearted about it. Uh, was okay with me, including the parts about his, you know, heroin and crack addiction, and, you know. Um, all of the things that sort of happened around that and my experience with it. And, and, and then um, the other thing I think was that there was always this feeling, my brother and I used to always say, you're the only one who knows what happened. Exactly. Nobody else knows. And we say that to each other all the time. Even our dad and Bonnie to some extent, I don't think understood really what Oregon was and how hard of a place that was to live or what happened in Synanon, which was actually a very, very hard place to live. You have a great uh, line that you both survived a plane crash, but nobody saw it. Right. And that's what bonded you together. And I think that's a really great line among many great lines. But you were both, you were in this plane crash, and, but nobody saw the plane go down. Nobody right. saw the flames. Nobody saw what was right. going on. Just the two of you. But when he sat and read that, it's like, wait a second, we had the same experience. You yeah. saw the same things I did. And for you, having had the therapy and the walk and all these kind of things to put it together, I'm sure it was very, very helpful for him as well, because it's like, wait a second, this is, we're all, we're both seeing this, but let's really, now we can talk about it, you know? Well, I mean, I hope so. There's the, there's kind of the artist in me that's like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's fully true, but there's the artist in me that's like, kind of like, 
you know, I just was trying to write it to be the best story it could be. And if it hurt him, I would put it in. If it helped him, I'd put it in. I think it does help. Um, but what I was really going for was just the emotional truth, the cycle, mm -hmm. like what actually each of these moments felt like, what, what was, what was the reality in my own mind, even if that reality was different from the one that I was being told was reality, even if that was different from the external reality. And you needed the external reality too. Um, and to try to answer the question, I feel like great books answer the question, so how was this world for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's all I was trying to answer, you know? And if there's anything I want a reader to take away from it, there's no real moral. I'm not a guy who can give morals. I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend to have that kind of wisdom. Just, just when someone, I, I hope it answers the questions. Here's how the, here's how the world was for me. Here's, mm -hmm. what, here's how I experienced it. Here's what I thought. You're also a voracious reader and you read a lot of memoirs. I could picture you studying memoirs, like, you know, before you went to write this. Um, I was thinking of Educated. I was thinking of Tara Westover's book a lot when I was reading this because, you know, she was in many of the same situations. She was in danger. She was in danger of like, you know, your life had been in danger at different parts as well. What are some of the memoirs you read that from the group? Well, that one, Tara's book. I think yeah. I agree. Tara's book is just brilliant and devastating. And I'm really grateful for her just having written it just as a reader. I mean, it's yeah. a wonderful book. I always um, think about hers too, because you know how parents try to get their kids into school and whatever, and everybody's going, oh, I kind of this, and I'm sitting there like, let me just tell you about this woman right. who bought the ACT book to teach herself, and then she taught herself physics, and then she taught herself algebra, geometry, yeah. so she could take the test to get into college, and you just, like, this was like, and that's the reason I saw a lot of parallels to your book of like, this is what we've got to do. Like, you've got to go do this stuff, either that or you're not going to get out of where you are, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I agree. And I think part of the genius of her book is just that um, it's the style in which she tells it as well. I mean, it, it, it's sort of the fact that she includes footnotes, the fact that she includes sort of this academic's eye towards her story, um, you know, sort of mirrors the ultimate point that education is sort of the path to kind of a freedom from whatever origin you have. And, and so I just thought, what a brilliant way of doing that by mirroring that it really flatters the intelligence of the reader. And so I just I, you know, she's great. Um, I also loved uh, This Boy's Life um, by Tobias Wolf. Um, I, I think that book, I just loved how honestly it's about all the scheming he's doing. Mm -hmm. All the ways he's like lying and he's trying to, but then also the tragedy of just being under the thumb of adults that may mm -hmm. not have your best interest at heart. And he really brings that conflict. Here's this vibrant, smart, capable kid just absolutely pinned down by the adults who don't who don't really necessarily either understand or actively don't have his interests at heart. And I thought he captured that so well. Um, Year of Magical Thinking is just a wonderful, wonderful book. Joan Didion's a powerful writer. And I like the interiority of that book and how much she, she, it, the part that really helped me in terms of writing was just thinking about, okay, don't just say what happened. Say, you know, someone, when you know their imagination, mm -hmm. what did you imagine this event to be? Because, so much of how we actually go through our day-to-day -day lives. It's like, you say, how are you doing? He's like, oh man, I just feel like I'm in this storm right now. That's something a friend might say to you. Oh man, it's like being trapped underwater. Like mm -hmm. we actually process our lives that way. Mm -hmm. um, and she did that fearlessly and sort of, I thought extremely eloquently in that book. So, um, and then of course, um, you know, Angela's Ashes was huge, uh, just funny and bizarre. Mm -hmm. And then I know why Cage Bird Sings is sort of like, Oh, you think you've written a good book? Okay, read that book. Okay, mm -hmm. and it was sort of like this this unattainable standard of every page is a piece of poetry, every page has to have life, every page is going to capture, you know, not just the history but sort of the it's going to probe the interiority, um, and it's going to just you know somebody said you know a great book is a series of great sentences, and um, I don't know any other book. That, that does that as well as um, I know why the cage bird sings. Um, and then a ton of novels also, mm -hmm. of course. I read about 150 books in the process, which for you, you're like, that's a month. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of months. You know, it's, Joan Didion, it was interesting. I was down at the Miami Book Fair one year and she spoke and it was a fantastic, fantastic talk. And there's a really long line to get your book signed. And I, I'm not a big one on getting books signed, but I was out in the parking lot and I turned around and went back in and got on that line to get the book signed because it had that kind of an impact of hearing her speak and telling that story. And I'd seen her the night before she did the National Book Awards and just see this, 
And you, I said, I have to have you sign this book and I never do this. Like I was in the car and she was just looking at me like I was a crazy person. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just, I had connected with that book so much about being in that inside, in the inside of like, you know, she was really spilling what happened and the emotion of what she was going through. Mm -hmm. But clearly and distinctly, which was wonderful. Um, you wrote for a number of magazines before you started the band. Did you always enjoy writing? Was that something that was always a creative outlet for you? Yeah, I kind of, I think I probably always knew I was going to be a writer of some kind. Um, that's what I did as a kid a lot. I would write stories. They'd end up on the fridge. Uh, well, in LA, they end up on the fridge. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it's kind of was the way, somewhere in my mind, I always just thought the writers are the smart people. The writers are the great minds of, the, of a society. I, that was a sense I had at 12 you know, 14, whatever. Um, and then in college, you know, I, I didn't study writing because this is going to sound pretentious as hell. Uh, it just felt like cheating. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to cheat. And I probably slowed me down, by the way. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, I mean, I think going through a writing program might actually be a lot better. I'm not sure. But I didn't, I just always read on my own. And so I, to this day, I don't know. I've read, you know, um, I've become a, a, a reader that, that enjoys writers. You know, I've read a lot of books as an adult i don't know what people talk about in literature classes i've read mm -hmm. you know um i started with vonnegut because i'm a generation x white guy that's the law uh, so gotta do that. I gotta do I that. Love yeah. kurt vonnegut. and i i did i just love kurt vonnegut so i read i read every word kurt vonnegut ever wrote I, i'd do this i'd kind of find authors you know because i didn't didn't experience college english really um so i'd find authors and then just try to get my head around who they were and I'd read everything they ever wrote. So I read every sentence he wrote. I read every sentence Philip Roth wrote. Um, and Roth is just a powerful lyrical writer. Uh, the things he does with paragraphs and voice and just, he's the kind of guy, you know, you, you read Roth and you want to write. You know? mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, and then um, Alice Munro, probably the most beautiful sentences of anybody, maybe um, just in purely in terms of sentences. And I love how our stories are always a head fake. You know, you, oh, it's, it's not going to be about the shop owner from Ontario. No, no it's, it's actually going to be about the guy who works on the dock and the dead wife that the shop owner actually was sisters with. <laughs> you know, gotcha. she always turns the story. Gotcha. I think. Yeah, there's always that sort of like exposition that's a third of it. And then she kind of, tw and it, but it draws you in. And but right. mostly it's like she just writes beautiful stories. Yeah. Beggar Maid and the Lives of Girls and Women were huge. Beggar Maid, probably the most of all. Just what a, Tremendous, tremendous book. I, I loved, I loved those stories. Um, so, uh, and then I, I moved on to uh, Don DeLillo, uh, funny, satirical, amazing. Um, I read every, every Nabokov word, hugely admired Nabokov because he's just a genius. And, you know, I don't know, um, Camus and Kafka and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, just so I wouldn't be scared of them. Mm -hmm. you know, and I could talk about them when somebody said something, I could be like, oh, I know what you're talking about. But I, I don't know if they were like mm -hmm. huge for me. And then I like Johnny Franzen. Um, like I love those books. They're wonderful. He also gives great sentence and great paragraph and makes you want to write because he's so lyrical. Um, and then I came finally, I'd say eventually to like people like Marilyn Robinson. Gilead was kind of a really important book for me. Um, and um, then Toni Morrison. Um, I'm really glad I got to Beloved late in life. I don't think I would have been able to understand that book when I was 20. And God, what a book. Uh, and I probably read that four times while writing this book. Um, and she's just such a, you know, like, like they say about Michael Jordan has no holes in his game. Mm -hmm. No holes in her game. Oh, she's, she's, she makes beautiful sentences. She writes honestly and from this perspective that's just so raw. Like, um, But then also never talks down to a reader, allows for confusion. You got to catch up. You got to keep up. It's almost scriptural and it's, denseness and editing but then all, at times massively personal and lyrical um and she really probes the interior world of in her case uh, in beloved like slaves really understands slavery as psychological trauma emotional trauma generational trauma and you when you read the books you know we sort of understand it as a, a malady of of you know government or something or maybe that's how i've understood it as a white person or something uh learning about it but reading those books, it was like, oh God. So that would mean that, of oh, well, of course her kid would have died. Oh, that would mean that she never saw her brother. What is that? What is it like to never see your brother? Oh, that would mean when they escaped, they actually lost a lot of things too, because, and then, oh, and they almost died. And then they had to be, they must've had nightmares. That's what happens when people, they have nightmares. Oh, that's what this is. And then it hits you like, oh, and the tragedy of it um, and the humanity of it. 
and she's uh, that book. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that, that was sort of like the the gold standard um, in writing this book. Yeah, and when you're sitting and writing, your writing is so visual. Like you're 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 bringing people right into that moment, and it, it's visual and emotional at the same time, which is a trick to do to be able to be both. You're seeing the place, but you're feeling the feelings. And what I found is the sentences had both. And each of the sections brought this different kind of attitude to it. So I, I don't know, I was, I've been kind of blown away by this book, in case you can't tell. In case you can't oh, tell. Thank you. <laughs> blown away. When did you start writing it? When did you start? Oh, uh, I guess at this point, it must have been about four, four years ago, um, four and a half years ago, something like that. Um, and I, I spent about six months before um, I started writing, um, reading memoirs, writing essays about form, not for anyone, just for myself. Like a lot of it was just like, this is really working for me as a reader. Why? And I'd really try to, I'd take passages and I'd pull them apart. And I'm like, why is this working? And really try to understand why Frank McCourt made this choice or why Maya my Angelou made this choice and you know things like that. Uh, and then um, I spent a lot of time sort of creating places um, Morrison has this wonderful idea about rememory that the that memories just live in the places where where they happened and you can go back to the places and the memories are still there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of going back to somewhere you lived, let's say 20 years ago, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're like, oh my God. And you remember so many things and not just the things that happened in the event, right, right. but entire attitudes and emotions. And oh, you're like, this was a whole movement in my life. I fucking forgot about that because you'd moved on and done some other things. So I would go to the places, I would download everything I remembered into like a tape recorder for like hours. And then I'd come home and I'd spend a couple of days just writing around everything I remember, all the, all the emotions and the stories and the attitudes and everything I could visually think of. And um, I would create these long documents that were anywhere from like 20 to 50 pages long of each place. Uh, and then I'd call people, contemporaries that were there at the time and we'd compare notes, you know, and they're sort of like, well, what did you experience? Was, was this day did this happen and then oh no there was this because this other, oh that's right and then mm -hmm. try to like really get into it um and then um and then i did a little research you know sometimes particularly on like synanon and stuff but um for the most part i i didn't i tried not to write about anything i didn't experience firsthand and then anything that i thought somebody else was like no that's not that hard. i would just kind of take out of the book i was like all right mm -hmm. well this isn't a this isn't that kind of book this is a book i, I want to be deeply experienced fully real um, at the same time as it's kind of magical and metaphorical because that's actually how it felt. Um, and then, so when I sat down to write, you know, I, I was like, all right, we're going to write a scene in an apartment and play it. All right, let me pull that document up. And I'd read through it all and it was all there. And so then I could think about the story and the voice and the writing and the narration and not have to also spend that time probing my memory for all the different things. Cause I'd already kind of created this very vibrant location um, on the page what the walls look like, what the floors, we've got all that. So then you yeah. can and, and story. a lot of it too was like, what was spiritual about this moment? What was mysterious about me? What'd you get wrong? What mm -hmm. did you imagine was happening? How is this part of the, in addition to the sights and sounds and smells and events and facial expressions and clothing, how did you imagine this story? What was it in terms of the ontological progression of your life? And in that way, the book's really not written from a child's perspective. I mean, the truth is, it's what it is, is it's the emotional and psychological world of a child, the imagination of a child in dialogue with the 40-year-old writer who's like mm -hmm. trying to make sense of it because, you know, five-year-olds just don't say things that are on that page. But um, the whole point is, I think the reader sort of knows that from page one because obviously five-year-olds don't write books or maybe some do. Um, but th this was a, this is a work of, you know, um, it's a story. So they allow for like, all this is very real. At the same time as I understand, you know, there is a dialogue happening. And then of course, by the end, I try to merge those. So by the time you get to the final page and I won't give it away, mm -hmm. but all those things that sort of happen. And again, you get a bit of magical realism, you know, mm -hmm. even at the very end as an adult, um, where I'm sort of trying to merge the two perspectives into it all just being this greater point, which I don't want to give away. But. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, but there were 13 drafts to get to this point. It's not like it happened, you know, yesterday and stuff like that. Did you ever think you'd like abandon 13 full drafts, like print it out. I should, here. Yeah. Here's your paper. <laughs> no, it's just, this is, uh, I was looking through this the other day because somebody asked me about it and they were like, so how did you do the drafts? And I was like, well, so this is draft. This is one of the drafts. Wow. So I print them out. Um, just a Microsoft Word document. And then the pages were all like, I mean, I was like, oh, so you would change a few words here and there. And it's just like page 
after page wow after page of just rewrite 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 edit rewrite rewrite edit rewrite cut edit you know uh just brute force probably a better writer doesn't need to do stuff like this but um you know it was this it was just kind of like you just kind of come to any page and it's there's so i did this 13 times um just trying to um craft you know and one of the great things about being a writer is you know the reader experiences it in real time and reads it in 10 hours or 12 hours or whatever and you've got three years so use the time wisely and try to try to really craft so that's what i did word choice and detailed choice and transitions and what am i really trying to say and again i would come back to i know why the caged bird sings or i'd come back to beloved and i'd be like okay you think you've written a book all right no it's not every page every page Every word's going to matter. Every word. And it's probably the reason that I do remember so much because it was tight. The story was tight. There was not, and there was, a, it, and I noticed that as I was reading, but it was also this propulsive kind of a read in, because you were really in the person's head. Like you really felt like you got to know the person as you were sitting and reading the book. It's not like, I didn't feel like it was, it was some fake story or anything like that at all. It was um, dead on. So you wrote six days a week. Writing day for you is sitting in that chair. <laughs> So yeah, I'm up, I'm up before dawn, big cup of coffee, apple, almond butter, <laughs> a little bit of food, um, write for four to five hours, usually have a daily word goal, um, take a lunchtime off, go have lunch with my wife, who's like a poor war widow up there, uh, <laughs> you know, or my, eventually my son, um, uh, and um, they were, um, she was very, very good about um, letting me have the space to go crazy because I kind of went a little crazy. Um, and then afternoons um, reading, I read four to five hours. I can't write unless I read. I know mm -hmm. other writers, they can. I don't know how they do it, but it's it's almost like reading. It's it's like workout for my brain and just, it's like put a bunch of words in and then you're reminded of what sentences are and what stories are and what smart people think and that you don't need to, and then, okay, this is the world. This is, okay, this is the world. And then the next morning when you sit down, I, you know, I feel like, for me anyway i'm much more able to construct something that's you know worth reading um so yeah six days a week um usually straight i took i did take some breaks for like a month at a time sometimes um there was a good year there where i didn't do anything though um mm -hmm. it was six days a week i didn't have a single party i didn't go to a single event it was just locked in my hermitage and it, it and I, I didn't shower that much. It was bad news. And I, you know, it was and, and in this weird way, it's like this swamp. And because it's like all these other things start to matter less. But in this wonderful way, taking away all these external things allowed the space for this rigorous, challenging intellectual enterprise to go on. Where you know, um, every day I'm just wrestling with this story. It, you know, and, and it allowed for me to really have think large about the book. And, and and really give it my full attention. Um, and it was way more involved and challenging than I ever thought it would be. Um, and you know, it's it's only my first book, so I don't I don't know how other people do it. I've never been in a writing class, I've never taken a real English class. Like I don't I just don't know what other people do. I for me it, it, brute force and you know repetition seem to be helpful. Well, to me, it's, it was almost like when we were describing this, it's almost like an athlete. It's like the Mac Michael Phelps. So he goes, he works out, then he does yeah. some other kind of, okay, he's in the pool, but he's not in the pool right. that much. Right. He's doing this other thing yeah. that gets you to be better in the pool. And then he's going and doing this because that's going to help be in the pool. Yeah. But you're not in the pool. I mean, you're swimming for, what is it, 30 seconds or something like that. But it's all what you have to do. What's to the get singularity of purpose? It's like, what does it look like to have singularity of purpose in your life? And maybe one other time in my life I ever really had that, I think. And never for as long a time as I had and never as intensely um, mm -hmm. as I did on this process. Um, you only get one chance to do something uh, like this. I, I don't get to tell this story again. That's what I kept returning to. I don't get to tell this story. If I was writing a novel, like, right, I'm gonna write other novels, like, you know, whatever. But I know I can only tell this story once. And so I really wanted to get it right. Um, and so I was extremely driven to to do so in every possible thing I could do to do it. I, I wanted to make sure I did. Yeah. At the same time, you have this band, which I have to ask what the meaning of airborne toxic event is, because I have to tell you, I had to write that down three times and reading off the page. What's the name of the band? And at what point were you doing music while you were doing this? Or was this just the writing time? 
So the name of the band is the second section of White Noise. Uh, Don DeLillo, the first section, I think, is Dilarama. The second section, or is that the third section? Yeah. Um, I should know. But the second section is the Airborne Toxic event in White Noise. Jack Gladney, his character, the Hitler Studies professor, witnesses a rail car accident that releases this giant chemical cloud. He suddenly in, he breathes some of it in um, while on a trip with the family and then suddenly become aware that he might die. So he goes to see the doctor and the doctor says, you're going to die. And he's like, tell it to me straight, doc. How long do I have? He's like, well, it could be tomorrow or it could be in 50 years. We don't really know, but you're definitely going to die. And he's like, oh my God. And so I think the sort of the satirical kind of point uh, is something like, yeah, we're all going to die. And if you're more aware of it, maybe and it changes the way he approaches his life. This awareness of his own mortality changes the way he approaches his life. And this was a theme in my life that I was dealing with very heavily when I started the band. It was like this sense like, well, I'm going to die. I don't have that long. What do I want to do with it? I kind of want to make music. All right. So let's just call the band that. Also, I had met Robert Smith and because um, I was a journalist. I was a really bad music journalist. And, and he had told me, like, just don't be normal. Just go do weird shit. So I was like, all right, that's weird. That's a neologistic term that I can inhabit, I guess. Uh, so I called the band the Airborne Toxic Man. It was kind of an art rock band. I, I didn't think it would grow to be some big sort of thing. I might have worn, I might have like named us something else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, what year was that? What year did you start the band? Uh, 2006. 2006. Oh, long time ago. Yeah. Long no, we've long, been around for a while. Long, long time ago. Yeah, and I see pictures because I did some just a little breathing on the internet and there's you walking off stage in Coachella there's like you're doing all these things all these night you let's put so you've done your rounds on talk shows you've done your rounds on doing these kinds of things yeah. when did you start writing uh, music and lyrics was it oh, when I was 15 I had a guitar uh when I was 15 16 years old my friend Drew uh played um was it Life on Mars no it was Ground Control to Major Tom <laughs> and I was like what the hell is that and he was like what I'm playing chords I'm like what's a chord I didn't know music at all. And then immediately I started writing songs. The second I could play chords, I started writing songs. And I always thought of it as a creative outlet. So I always played songs uh, all the way through my early, um, like when I got out of college, I played songs. I worked in like nonprofits and worked as a teacher for a minute and worked as a ranch hand and a carpenter's assistant, had all these different jobs. And I always wrote songs, wrote songs. And then when I started writing, um, uh, when I was a journalist for a while, I always wrote songs and I would interview these rock stars and I would always just kind of, I was so bad at it because I would just ask them about their songwriting process because I, I was, it was like my own little field study, you know. How do you um, do that? How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, seriously. How'd you write this song? What'd you do? What about that bridge? Where does that bridge come from? Why'd you change the key? I noticed you sped it up right here. Why'd you do that? You know, and and, um, and then uh, somewhere I, I'd done some important interviews with David Bowie and Robert Smith, who were idols of mine growing up in and they'd given me some really great advice about songwriting and I took it and um, wrote this song called Wishing Well. Uh, and it was the first song I wrote that I was like, okay, maybe somebody else could hear this. I, otherwise, before that, it was just me. You know, no one ever heard any of this. Mm. You know, I'd play for like a girlfriend or something and she'd be like, oh, you're really good. And I'd be like, oh, really? You know, but I never, I never <laughs> thought to like, I don't know. maybe go on the road. Yeah. <laughs> right, never, I, I just didn't think I was that good at it. And then I heard that song, I wrote that song. I was like, okay, maybe I should start a band. Um, and then at that point, I actually had gotten into Yato. Um, I'd written a short story that got printed in uh, McSweeney's Quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it got me into Yato. I got a summer, two, two months to do, a, you know, a finish it and turn that. I was going to turn it into a novella. Uh, it was like prime real estate at Yato. And right around this time, I met a drummer. And I wrote them. I was like, I, I can't come. And they were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, I met a drummer. And so I started, instead, I started a band called the Airborne Toxic Band. <laughs> it's, it's literary. It's really it's literary. literary. Yeah, yeah, it's very literary. I wrote songs about like Irwin Shaw short stories and stuff. Like that. we have a song called The Girls in Their Summer Dresses. And I wrote a song about the Hitchhiker's Game. Um, you know, and I, I it was kind of like, that was one of the organizing principles of the group. Um, so then... Um, uh, w when I was making this um, book, I, I was writing songs. And so eventually about halfway through, I thought, oh, all these songs are about this. You know, a movie can have a soundtrack. Why can't a book have a soundtrack? So I talked to the band and we decided to make this record the, the soundtrack to, to the book. Well, I was still looking at the snag and it's advanced listening copy and I've had it on auto repeat for the last couple of days. And I'm actually singing along now and I sing really badly. So oh, you good. Know. You're entitled. 
But my son came up to my office last night and he goes, what are you listening to? And I was like, oh, let me tell you about this. And I, I think I got really cool for about five minutes to my son, you know, because like, wow, mom, you really? And it was What's always all this every, screaming. Yeah, like, mom, What's he like, screaming? What? What's he so upset about? But then it, like when I'm listening to that as I was working on interview questions last night, you really see like the whole thing involving, it's a whole different way of telling the same story. You're telling the same story and, and, and it's, it's brilliant as a result. Was it, so was it always gonna be, like, it's kind of cool to have a companion because I've always thought that books could have a soundtrack. Like there are things oh. that could actually sit and work and now we got one, you know? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of a muscle that I've developed over the years of songwriting is just kind of, it's in, in a weird way, it's more physical. It's like, cause you're in your body, you're singing. So much of it's about delivery and inflection and melody is a very physical sort of thing. Um, so it's more like dunking a basketball in some ways, just like through repetition you and you, you, you create the ability to do this kind of elegant thing. Um, so yeah, I was writing a lot of songs. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. No, so it was, <laughs> yeah. Dunking like, basketballs. Like the, the original, well, you always thought about, like, you know, they would be doing this at the same time. That they would oh, be only about halfway through that I realized that's what yeah. was happening. But I'd written a bunch of songs and I was like, oh, obviously, okay. And then when I talked to the band about it and they were all for it and we decided to make it this whole concept record. Um, so the record, you know, could stand on its own. The idea is that you don't need to have the book to hear the record right. or hear the book to, or know the book to hear the record or vice versa. And um, it was sort of like, you know, the saying is you, you don't do what they do, you seek what they sought. And we were seeking, I think, maybe what Pink Floyd sought during the wall, which was this record that, you know, Roger Waters' father died in World War II um, as, in a tank um, battle. Uh, he um, suffered a lot of trauma as a result of that. It really changed the dynamic for him and his mother's relationship. He eventually becomes an artist. He builds a wall. He lives behind that wall. And by the end of it, he tears the wall down. So we kind of, the historical forces affect the child in this difficult way. That child creates a man. That man eventually realizes he has to make some changes. Um, and that's that's sort of what this, the, the book and, and also, of course, the record mirror that, you know, except in my case, it was, you know, the human potential movement, the call, um, maybe my time, my dad's time in prison, my experience with, you know, um, addiction growing up. Um, I think there's the ghost of Vietnam in this book is kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. I think people mm -hmm. forget how much Vietnam was still very much with us in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Just a huge part of our national psyche. Um, and I think it's in the background of my book. There's Nixon and Reagan, you know, and a lot of the kind of culture war fights are still very vital. Mm -hmm. um, and um, those historical forces in my life were huge. My mom was a free speech activist, you know, in Berkeley. Uh, who moved into a human potential cult where I was put into an orphanage. My dad got went there when he got out of prison to get clean off heroin. Um, and so these historical forces actually like very much affected my life. And mm -hmm. so then trying to sing about that, sing about my dad's life before I was born, to sing about my childhood and to sing eventually about my adult relationships and trying to make sense of this. And then, uh, of course, by the end, my father's death and maybe some of the new conclusions I came to about, I don't know, love and family and you know, what, what these sort of stories mean um, by the end of the record. Which also take on a different feeling when you become a parent. Like what, what defines a dad, what becomes whatever, just changes along the way. What's easiest or what's, okay, I was thinking about it because it's writing a book, writing music and writing lyrics are really three different things. They're really three different, you know, exercises. Is there anyone that comes more easily to you? Like when you could just sit down and start strumming. Probably writing. Or, so probably what? writing probably okay. writing like i mean i don't know i always feel like a kind of a outsider as a musician i feel like a little pointy-headed a little nerdy to be <laughs> you know like as a musician most musicians are like so they, and it's kind of cool and everything yeah. they do is cool and they talk in cool ways and they do cool shit and then they write cool songs and i'm like how did he even figure that out it was just like the manifestation of his coolness or something and i'm <laughs> i'm way more you know nebbishy <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how okay. to put it. I'm way more like, I figured this out. I got to do the thing. And what are they doing? What should I do? You know, uh, as a writer, I don't feel that way. Um, I feel very much in my element. I feel comfortable with words. Um, I feel comfortable reading and writing. I feel comfortable around other writers. You know, I don't feel like an outsider. These are my people. Um, so probably writing, um, even though I've, at this point, my career is much more as a musician. Yeah, yeah, but it's um, hard to say because it's like they're different things. So it's you know I don't I don't know I don't I don't really think of it. They're both kind of manifestations of this 
desire as an artist, it's like a primal scream. You want to be heard. There's a part of you that cries out to be heard. And that's why you need to write the song. That's why you need to write the short story or the book. There's a thing that's not being seen. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels. It's got to be seen. I need, to, I need this to be seen. I need someone to see what happened in 10 years old that night when he beat me up and he was bigger and I was smaller and it wasn't fair. And he mm. thought nobody was going to see because he was bigger and smaller and no one was there. Well, guess what? People are going to see. Mm -hmm. like that idea applied to the cult, applied to, I don't know, all those AA meetings, maybe to some extent to my brother, my experience with addiction. And then eventually as an adult to my own sort of inner turmoil with my struggle with, you know, finding... I don't know, a safe place to land after having experienced all this stuff. I don't, I, I want that to be seen. And that's, that's the place from which that's the wellspring from which the, the book came and also where the songwriting comes from. Well, it's funny because I was a huge Paul Simon fan for the years and Paul's always sitting there going, it was luck, like where he ended up for a large degree of what happened. And he says it's yeah. talent, but it's also being in the right place. It's also the you know, right place, right time and stuff too, you yeah. know? That's a once in a generation talent. I don't believe him for one word. I don't, I don't believe him for one second. John, Paul Simon, I, I always return to that one line in Graceland, you know, as if I'd never noticed the way she pulled her. They say losing love is like uh, a window in your heart. In your heart. Everyone yeah. can see um, torn apart. Yeah. Everyone here's the wind blows. It, um, like there's devastating lines as if I'd never noticed the way she wiped her hair from her forehead. Like what a right. line. Right. What an economical line. He's, He's divorced. He's got his kid. They're driving somewhere. He's going to see Elvis. And it's like, it would take a hundred pages of a novel to capture that scene. Exactly. And you know how he used to write? It does he, it like that. He'd sit and throw a tennis ball against the wall. And that's how he'd write. The rhythm of a tennis ball. And then he'd be doing lyrics at the same time. It's very yeah, strange. He's a genius. Really he's just an utter genius. Yeah. And then walked away. And then walked away and said, I don't want to tour anymore. All this stuff. He's living in Hawaii. It gets well, I, saw, I saw him a couple of years ago at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, was, um, he still had it. I mean, <laughs> it was great. It was I great. saw the last concert of far the one in for Park, the last one, the last oh, one, uh, yeah. the last one of the last tour. The, right, right, yeah. And it was I was way up close. I was standing oh, you know, like in the mosh pit. One of the few. I couldn't walk for two for days. Most people, he was a speck. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, and it's also interesting too, though, because when you're writing a song, a lot of times you're writing by yourself, then you play it for the band, then you tweak it from there. Yeah. There's a difference because what's the difference between working with the band and working with the editor? Like you're oh. working with Jamie, you're working with Susan, you're working with these people that are shaping your work. It's different, is it? Yeah, uh, much more solitary. Um, honestly, the book isn't that different from my Microsoft Word document. Um, I got some wonderful guidance, particularly from uh, Susan and Jamie. But you know, um, that's just it's, you're basically there alone making someone. You can talk to an editor for an hour get a bunch of notes and then you're still alone with the thing for the next month if you do the rewrite or the two months whatever it takes to do the rewrite um uh, whereas yeah with music it's like all right i made the demo come over it's fun it's social you, you get to have a beer and talk about and play guitar and you're like what about this friend i want i want he's like no no how about this but i want to where you like, oh that's the one and then you put it on the thing and then you have another sip of beer and then you call the other guys and you're like what do we did this thing we're doing this harmony like, oh okay cool i'll be there at three and then it, you know it's fun it's social and it's it's, it's that's why people are in rock bands i remember when I, when I was working for npr I, I used to be on all things considered and bob boylan was my my, my director who does tiny desk and um i i called him when i started the band i was like you know i i don't know should i should um, I don't know if I, I have this kind of writing career going that seems kind of promising because uh, I was like the young edgy commentator and all things considered. So I was like, this is a good spot. You know, the writer got into Yaddo, that was happening. So I was like, okay. Um, and he was like, no, man, go be in a rock band. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, that's way more fun. You can always write. Write when you're 40, go be in a rock band. <laughs> you have a great time. And he was right. <laughs> It's it was the more. rock bottom remainders. Those are the authors who made a band years ago, you know, and it's like, you know, Stephen King and, you know, uh, what's his name? Scott Turow on, on tambourine or something like that. Yeah, right. yeah there that. is. Yeah. I got to send you some King stuff. Oh, yeah. They, and they, they play, they played for charity and it was, I can't remember everybody who was in it, but it was really funny because it'd be things like you could only hit the tambourine. That's the only thing you do. And they could still do it off key. <laughs> charity oh gosh. they put out a record it was the calm before the calm mitch album <laughs> stephen king i've i got to remember who else was in this but That's we would funny. just show up and they would be like if we went to a book festival like the miami book for or, or la 
they would have a stage that they would go and play on. And it, it was always just fun. Was- I think I tried to think of myself as maybe like in trying to pursue something like Nick Cave or maybe Leonard Cohen, where you sort of have this world in letters, as it were, in Leonard Cohen's case, it was poetry, but Nick Cave writes books, you know, but then you also have, um, you know, this, you're a serious musician, that you're actually serious about both, um, even though you engage them in different ways, like Nick Cave can be very touching as a, as a songwriter, and then his books are just dark and gothic and sort of highly lyrical. I guess Leonard Cohen, it's the same thing because it's literally the same verse. He just gives it a melody. Well, I know the night that I saw you perform in um, January and you would sing, talk about the book, then you'd sing, then you talk about the book. And it was just very, very effective evening. I mean, it was really wonderful because you came back and you had this experience instead. And I'm not somebody who always loves people reading their books. Like when they're- That's boring. "Mm." But when you told the song that went with the book and the story, well, then that was totally different. That night was so stressful because I thought I screwed up. From the minute I walked out, I thought I was bombing because it was so quiet. Mm-hmm. The room was silent, except for, the, I mean, I made some jokes and we got, I got some laughs. I was like, okay, I got to laugh. That was good. But then it was silent for most of it. And I, I remember I walking off stage and Rachel Chow, who was the head of marketing for Celadon, was there who'd set up the whole event and had this whole venue packed and all these people. And I'd given this talk and I, I, I walked off stage. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm so sorry I screwed that up. I'm so, I, I, I just felt like I completely messed it up. And she kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I just screwed that whole thing up. I know you set this whole thing up and I know it took a lot of time and I'm really sorry I let you down. You know, it felt, it felt like bombing. I think that people were blown like, away. I think that people were blown away because I think that, and because I was in the audience that night and I'm sitting there and I'm watching, I'm watching people's reactions because I'd already met you the week before I'd read the book. Not everybody in the audience had read the book. Like we were yeah. at that point too. Yeah, and you, there, I watched people connecting and I was sitting, like I sat in the back, which I've always wanted to do is I sit in the back so that I can yeah. journalist part of me that just right. watches the room. And I was sitting in the back watching and I was, I was watching people I knew in that room. I'm watching them connecting and I know one was leaving and no one was running to the bathroom and no one was going to get a drink. And I was like, this is a really interesting moment because that's what you did that night. Oh. So when they don't move or something like that, it's, and this is not the big clappy cloud. Remember, when you go to a book event, it's not like sitting like this the whole time. You're used to sing a song clapping, sing a oh, song yeah. clapping. In a rock band, you walk out and they're like, oh my God, he's here. And they're like screaming just because, and you're just like, ha ha. I just <laughs> walked outside. Like stand there with a guitar, just like, ha ha. Look, the bass player is here too. Ha <laughs> ha, bet you weren't expecting that. And it's like, you're so, everything you do is so, and it's like you're at a book event and you walk out and everyone's just like, and then it's quiet. For an hour and a half or an hour, whatever it was. And I was just like, I'm bombing this. I'm screwing this up. Oh my God. This is You're like, I'm going to go over and do the piano now. But it was really funny because it was like, I'm going to do this. And then at one point it's like, I'm going to go to the piano. And it was almost like, okay, let me see if I can get them now. Like I thought what was going on in your head. It's like, maybe now they'll react. I'm going to go do this. Like, <laughs> totally. No, no, no. It's totally the crowd. It's a very intellectual crowd. And it was at the end, but there was a standing ovation at the end. So yeah. yeah, you did nail that. But you couldn't see from the lights of what they were doing anyway. No, you know? I, just, I, I ran off stage just like, <laughs> get me off of here. I kind of just, I just could. And in my head, I was like, just get through it. Just get through it. Just get through it. You're, you're bombing. It's so fine. We'll go get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Let's go out after the show. Yeah. Well, now you have two children. Um, one was born, I think, right after that event, if I remember correctly. That's right. I almost flew home. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's Rachel's like, I think I've got to get them on a plane right now. Yeah. Um, but I hope you wrapped up copies of this book for them with a special inscription that you'll give them later, not even someday later, because it's a special note from you, because I think it's the ultimate father's present to their child. And I really feel that so strongly. I feel this is a great Father's Day book. It's an homage to your dad. It's homage to who you've become in so many ways. But I feel like someday, this moment that you're encapsulating just before this book comes out, I would say inscribe one to each of them and just say uh, like, you know, how you felt, you know? I feel like they'll be like, I don't care, dad. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of your right as children to like not give a shit about things your parents did. You're like, I got my own shit going on. I don't care. Some book you wrote 20 years ago. You wait till like they're 20. You don't give it to them when yeah. they're five. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're going to want like, you know, some big toy that you're not even talking about. So are, I'm hoping that you're going to write another book. Am I going to get that lucky? I hope so. I, 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 I've been working on a book outline. Um, and so I, I don't know. Um, I don't want to say I'm certain because I feel like these things require such tremendous mm-hmm. effort that it's hard to just be like, I know. But 
yeah, I think ideally this would be the first of many books. Um, and I, I kind of feel like this is my first foray into, um, the, but I, I don't know. I mean, I have, it's, it's a whole other process. It's probably going to be its own kind of madness. And so I'll just let it, I, you know, I, I know there'll probably be another record. Um, and yeah, I'd say more than like that. It's, I'm, I have a big outline of a science fiction book, but that's all I, you know. There you go. You, well, you know how to sit in the chair. It's part of it. You got to put your butt in the chair. Like, like legit, just knowing the process is actually a big part of it. It's you also just know. like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit here for five hours, then we're going to read for four hours. We sit for five hours, we're going to read for four hours. And then you also don't have to commute. You're just going down to the, you know, like you're going down the room. This is, these are all good things, especially during a pandemic. And the other thing you also know is how to work with an editor, how to work with an agent going forward, what, you know, what you'll do. And I think that that's- Well, I just feel, I feel very lucky to have them. I mean, I, I feel extremely lucky to have Susan- I didn't have them at the start. I got them after the book was done. Like I finished the book without an editor, publisher, agent, anything. It was all just me alone in the room. Um, and then I went out and started the process. And I, I feel Jamie Rabb is just a wonderful person who believes in books and believes in me and is mm -hmm. tremendous, tremendous. Just, I just, she's just a great human. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan is a force of nature. There's a reason why she is who she is. She's a force of nature. She's a genius at so many different things. And I just feel like I have these like powerful women that are just like out there fronting for me, you know. <laughs> this way they're out there doing for you. No, 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 no. I, I just feel I feel really lucky. I feel in really good, good hands. Yeah, this morning I looked up and I said, oh, I wonder when this deal was made, and it was only like last June. Yeah. And the fact that this book is out, I mean, that's quick for a book. Because I mean that that means you yeah. were you know in really great shape before you came in with it. Because if I was reading it in December, that's you know six months later. That's real you know swift to yeah, the game. Yeah, I was told it was something called clean, which I don't really know what that meant because it's my first book. But um, mm -hmm. I guess that was a, it was a good thing. Um, and if say it told me this book needs a ton of editing, I would have been like, okay, I, I just had no idea one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it turned out to be good. And a lot of it, you know, it's, you're lucky to have people that believe in you. I feel lucky, mm -hmm. I'm lucky. Some people, there's wonderful writers out there who don't have people who believe in them. And I just, you know, um, I feel so fortunate that I was able to, to find some um, that did. The right moment in the middle of even a pandemic and the way everything was adapted, it was incredible. I wish you lots of luck. I hope our paths cross again soon. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Carol, well, this was really fun. Thank you. I really, I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah I really enjoyed it. And I am looking forward to all of our readers reading how they par Hollywood Park. And to you, lots of luck. And to the audience, uh, see you next time. Thank yeah. you so much. Way down the road. Thank you, Carol.